Go back to verse 7. Who's speaking? Who is I will proclaim? Yeah, okay, that's the anointed one, isn't it? That's Christ, that's the Son. The Son of God will rule the nations. That's what we want to talk about today. How does Christ rule over civil government? Number two, even while Israel was in captivity in Babylon, Isaiah promised that the Lord would do what? Look up Isaiah chapter 60, page 779. According to verse number one, they're in captivity. Isaiah is writing to those in captivity. And what does he say the Lord will do? What is coming to those in captivity? Light, okay. Who is the light, or what, I should say, what is the light? See, the glory of the Lord, isn't it? And if you go to verse number two, with darkness covering the earth and thick darkness the people, the Lord will come. That's over the people. That's over the nations. Not, that's not only over Israel. It's over those nations. Go to verse number three. <clears throat> Who's going to come and live under this light? Even kings. Even the kings are going to be subject to the light of the world. Now they don't act like it sometimes, do they? Verse 10. Your walls, I think, are the walls of Jerusalem, Mount Zion. Who else is going to be ruled by the, by the sun? By the anointed one. By the, these foreigners. Mm -hmm. Now, very likely, by the foreigners, I means the Babylonians and the Persians. But you can extend it to that time. He's going to rule over all those foreigners. The Egyptians. The Romans. The Greeks. See, he's going to rule. He's going to rule over all of them. Number three. Jesus will rule the nations with that shows his almighty power. I might have said it earlier even. <laughs> iron scepters? The iron scepter, isn't it? That's earthly power. He's not talking about ruling over the kings. Now, God loves the world, and, and you ought to come to Christ, and you ought to walk, follow the Ten Commandments. He doesn't say that to the nations of the earth. He comes with an iron scepter, right? Power, authority. Number four, I'm going to ask you to fill in the blanks while I read this. Christ will display his might to, and he will show his love to, one of those is power, an iron scepter. The other one is love, it's good news, it's gospel of peace. And by now I'm sure you filled it in. The iron scepter rules nations, okay? And the other one, the gospel, church, okay? Number five, while in his, I tell you what, let's, let's look up the Bible passage first. Philippians 2, and this is on page 1230. Did I say Philippians? Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know why, in my mind I'm hearing myself say Galatians. Okay, Philippians chapter 2. You know, somebody was going to do us a big favor and put the books of the Bible in here. That slows me down. <laughs> I know where they are. The problem is, evidently somebody thought, you don't know the books of the Bible. You know, Genesis, Exodus, you, you said those many, many times as a kid, didn't you? Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. I am going to read this completely, and you're going to look for the answer. While in his humility on earth, Christ was submissive to the governing powers, but according to Philippians 2, what will every human being do? So watch what every human being is going to do. Christ, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Oh, that could have been in my sermon this morning. Could have been. I saved it for here. What will all people do? Kneel. Okay, got that. Every yeah. will will knee, kneel and confess okay i thought i heard confess good confess his name he's the lord no one can say jesus is lord except by the holy spirit see that's why i thought it could have fit pretty well into today's sermon excuse me my allergy tabs work about four hours so right now your ragweed is creeping into this room <laughs> Know what you mean. It takes me a whole day back down in Phoenix to clear up. <laughs> it only took me all day Friday to get about as miserable as I've been in a long time. <laughs> I, I told Pastor this morning, I slept eight hours last night, and I blame all of it on allergies. Yes. <sighs> Just, yeah, there, there was no get up and go. But when I see God's people gather for Bible class, then I've got some get up and go. So I thank you for coming to Bible class. Let's look up Colossians chapter 1, page 1233. Colossians 1. I'm going to start reading at verse 15. You'll try to fill in these blanks as I go along. Christ is the firstborn. You see that? Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things are created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, which is the church. So you see the context, he's the head of both, all those four things, and the church. Who has all four of them filled in and like to say it out loud? Have to say it loud enough to hit the recorder. David, can you talk loud enough for the recorder? I hope so. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Thrones, or power, or rulers, or authority. Okay. Authorities. 
Remember before Jesus sent out his disciples? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Because that's King James. Who knows the NIV? All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Somehow I like the word authority better than power. Power, power that, that's lightning, that's thunder, that's earthquakes, that's hurricane eon, and that's storms and destruction. That's power. Authority is I'm in control and I may send the hurricanes and I may send earthquakes, but I'm in control. It's not like God sends devastating destruction. No, I have authority. Was there another blank in there someplace? Christ is the firstborn over all creation. Okay, we're going to get into some thinking time. We're going to have to think about history. The Bible contains history as well as law and gospel. But a lot of this history you're going to have to remember from high school. How many of you had history in college? Did any take a historical in college? You probably, unless you had my professor, were never told that history is his story. From in the beginning, it's his story. I've always liked that. Okay, number seven. Civil governments always serve Christ's purposes even when they are not aware of it. His control may take the form of natural calamity or war. When we study history, we see how he worked his will. How did he work his authority over Egypt? Well, he delivered the Israelites from captivity and allowed his uh, gospel, typical, typical story of showing Jesus as the Savior of the world. He showed that through the passage. Sure. God had his 70 people over here. And he needed an incubator so they could grow. Egypt was the incubator. God was in control. He sent Joseph. He put Joseph up there. They multiplied and he protected them. And then he called his people out of Egypt. <laughs> he did a little bit of power on, on, on Pharaoh. His chariots went down into the Red Sea and the water came back. Christ was in control. Okay, let's go on in history. Babylon. How did God use Babylon? Um, Babylon was, was one where they were rebelling against uh, God, and so God sent them over there for good, was it 70 years, I think, and yeah. so it kind of brought them back to realizing what they should be doing. I like to say Babylon was the hammer blow of God's law. The soldiers came and destroyed Jerusalem. They wiped out the temple. And I just remembered two sentences I forgot in my sermon. Paul knew these people respected the temples. Well, they respected the temples of Aphrodite and Zeus. And so here's the sentence I forgot. Think of what the Jews thought when the Assyrian army came and sacrificed pigs on the altar in Jerusalem. Horrible! Think of what the people of Jesus' generation thought when the Roman soldiers marched right into the temple. Horrible! Think of how we ought to think when people take this body and they desecrate it with sex and try to cover it up with murder. 
Now, maybe the Holy Spirit kept me from saying that in there. I don't know. <laughs> but I spent a lot of time writing about that horrible stuff. Sacrifice pigs on the altar? Pigs are unclean. Jews would shudder. Uh, let's go to Persia. Uh, you may think of Darius, King Darius, who, who was a Mede. The Medes and the Persians did what? And you got it? Sorry. When Babylon took them away, the Persians said, you could go back. And here's how Jesus was in control. Later, Darius followed Cyrus, and he found all the gold and brass and silver that was taken out of the temple. He sent it back with Ezra and Nehemiah to put it back in the new temple that they were building that was not nearly what Solomon built, which is why King Herod wanted to make a big one. For almost 400 years, Jews who realized what the Temple of Solomon was, how great Israel was as a civil government, they wept when they saw this little dinky temple. But it was still God's temple. So God takes this little body and he still uses it to his glory. It doesn't have to be a great big body that makes 23 million a year throwing footballs. Uh, I guess he gave them that talent too, but he didn't give it to me. I'm just going to toss out some gospel once in a while. <laughs> More power. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it does. It does. Okay. Uh, Greece. This was a big point of ancient history. Think of Alexander the Great and Greece. What did Jesus do with them, Dave? Well, I think there's kind of two points. Um, one with Greece is uh, they brought a language that was very precise so that we could be very precise on what was meant within the Bible. That probably is the big one. That's right. So you could have the Greek New Testament and across the empire, Greeks could understand Greek. And the Egyptians learned Greek. I was told just a couple days ago, everybody goes to Germany, learns English. Well, back in those days, if you went to Rome, you learned Greek. So it was called, God, God, you want to write this down? You're going to, Hellenization. <laughs> Greece was Helena, Helena. Hellenization was Greek culture, Greek customs, Greek freedoms. You want some Greek words? Grace, freedom, peace. New Testament is heart and core based on these beautiful Greek words. And then came the Romans. They subdued the Greeks. They didn't stop the language. What did the Romans do under God's control? They built roads. Roads. Oh. And if you want, if you want the Greek word, it's Pax Romana. The Roman peace. Their soldiers went way up into England. They built fences, I mean walls, stone walls to keep the Goths out and the Serbs, and the Celts, and the Picts. Rome controlled all of southern England at the time. They controlled North Africa. Roads, roads, roads. What did Paul do? He traveled. So God was in control of Rome and Caesar Augustus. Oh, Caesar said, you know the Messiah should be born in Bethlehem, let's issue this decree. Caesar Augustus didn't know that. Caesar Augustus didn't know anything about a savior being born in Bethlehem. See, Caesar Augustus never read a Hebrew Bible. And yet he's still doing what God wanted him to do. Pastor, 
Pastor, are, are you suggesting, are you stating that seven, civil governments always serve Christ's purposes, applies to the contemporary era? Right, is that what you're stating? That, it all, that all, all civil governments? All history. Before we're done with this. All right, t t tell me, how does Adolf Hitler's Germany serve Christ's purposes? How, how does, okay. how does I told you we're going to get this question. And Stalin's Soviet Union served Christ's how, purposes? How did God get his work done through Hitler or Stalin? And I got the same answer I taped this last week. Ask Pastor Henning next week. <laughs> no, I, I'll deal with it. That is very much part of this whole thing of civil government. Civil governments don't know anything about what God wants. What have they got? They got human reason. They've got their own education. They've got their scientists. I understand they're really working on a, a cure for the common cold. Now God may let them do it, but he's still in control of it. Here comes COVID. It spreads all over the place. And these Americans, Americans wanted to go all over the place. They wanted to hug everybody. They wanted to shake hands. They wanted to kiss. God is still in control on what COVID was going to do. Sometimes we don't see it. I remember that question about Hitler in particular. See, Germany was nominally Lutheran. Well, shouldn't the Lutheran believers, knowing the Bible, understand what Hitler was doing in the civil government? They should have. And there were a lot of Christian protesters against Hitler. And a lot of them wound up with the Jews. Now, God's in control. How did he let that happen? In my junior college history class, the, pa the pastor was teaching. The professor was a, a pastor. He said, we don't always see God's hand. But we believe he created the world and he guards and keeps us from all evil. We believe it. Well, when I study some history, I didn't mention the Assyrians here before Babylon came. The Assyrians were horrible. They killed most of the people rather than haul them off to, to captivity. And the Assyrians loved torturing people before they actually expired. We've seen some of that on television lately. Do you recall, was it 80 people lined up along the Sea of Galilee and just shot down on television? Well, on Facebook or whatever that was. Those were the same descendants of the Assyrians. That's still going on today. Christians who are being arrested in some of those Asian countries are terribly persecuted. Why? I don't know. What I do want us to all see is my Savior is in control. And in the end, every knee will bow and every knee mouth confess. Oh, I'm looking forward to that day. But until that time comes, we all just trickle under and we just accept whatever outrageous tyranny is exercised. That is a very good point. We are to submit to the authorities. There is no authority except of God. Now, I find that very hard. But let me go on to the next question, which is going to deal with how do we submit to that kind of stuff? A question came up uh, a good 25 years ago when I was teaching a class like this in Texas. A professor from our seminar, uh, from Martin Luther College, from our college in New Orleans, Minnesota, raised the question if a Christian in 1776 could have joined Washington. That's a pretty good question. And we debated that for a while. 
And we will debate this. By the way, this Bible class will take us, I'm convinced, past Thanksgiving. So the last Sunday I'm here, and that'll be the day you install the pastor in the afternoon, ask me the question again. <laughs> because now I can say, ask Pastor Henning. <laughs> then I'll have to say, this is what I believe. And my whole point here, because this is, that's probably the best question for the next eight weeks. How do you deal with Hitler? Or Mao Zedong? You know, or... or well, was, and any, I mean, of Uganda, and Pol Pot of Cambodia, and, and Mao Zedong of China. These yeah. are despicable tyrants who killed not just hundreds of thousands of people, but millions, millions. tens mm -hmm. of millions of people. Millions. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if I were in one of those countries, I would fight to the bloody end against that kind of tyranny. I'm not, I'm not going to... She has a very biblical answer. And because it spoils what I'm saying four weeks from today, I'm only going to give it to you in summary. Peter and John said to the Sanhedrin, who threw him in jail, we cannot but speak. We must obey God rather than men. And that's where the Christian steps out, picks up the gun, or whatever. See, but there's a, there's a lot to this question. And, and I'm glad you brought it up. But that's a, that's a thumb... That's not even a thumbnail answer. That's barely a pinky answer. I'm sorry. Good question. The two kingdoms are separate by creation. Identify the following as either church or government. And you can speed this up by using C for church and G for government. As soon as you figure it out, call it out loud enough so our people at home can hear it. For the punishment of evildoers. Government. government. Okay. For commending those who do good. Government. Oh, I thought I'd get you on that one. That's still government. <laughs> government is supposed to give Chief Alchese a Medal of Honor for his serving under General Crook. It exercises the sword it exercises the word. Church. I thought I'd get you. See, take the S off a of sword. You've got the sword for the government. You've got the word for the church. But I made it easy. It preaches the gospel. It's your church. It exists on a map. It exists in hearts. It works with bodily and temporal matters. The sword, see, see, the sword can affect this. The sword cannot pierce the heart of faith. It deals with eternally. With it. I think I lost man matters, didn't I? It works with bodily and temporal matters. It deals with eternal matters. Okay. Entered by the means of grace. Entered by physical birth. See, if you're born here, oh, that, that's why so, ma so many of these, these people come across the border, so the kid's born here. If he's born here, he's an American citizen. Of course, now they want to change that law. I hope they never do. Let's make it pointed. How did Jesus deal with these two? Number nine, Jesus submitted to the civil authorities as a child, as a little baby, really. Well, I thought somebody would say, <laughs> he let Mary ride a donkey all the way to Bethlehem, but that's not the answer I want. <laughs> Even when the government sent their soldiers, Jesus never sent angels to destroy the soldiers. Jesus allowed the government to follow its own dastardly evil and kill those babies. And I watched the news yesterday. 
And I say, why doesn't God stop this dastardly government that kills the babies? My God's in control, but 80 million, you know, we talked about millions before. And, well. <coughs> when the devil tempted him with? All the world. Uh -huh, I'm going to give you all the riches of the world, and you're going to be controlled. You'll be over all the nations. And Jesus said, now, devil, you know I've already got that. <laughs> well, that's not quite what he said to the devil. The devil says, no, I'm going to worship the Lord. When 5,000, remember he fed them and all of their families? Just a little boy's lunch. They wanted to do what? He wanted to make him a king. What did Jesus immediately do? He knew his disciples would like that. He sent the disciples back across the Sea of Galilee. And he went apart by himself in the mountains to pray. He did not kneel down and say, put the crown on my head. He knelt down and said, use a crown of thorns instead. In the garden, Garden of Gethsemane. I am he. And they tied him up. They bound him. If you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, he's got them putting all these chains on and chains on his feet, and he's walking like this into Jerusalem from the garden. I don't know. Most likely, they did what was common with slaves. They tied him up, and they led him. Now, when he first said, I am he, they all fell down to the ground. He was in control. And then he said, I'm he. You know? He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death on the cross. And I know that back under the Roman government, there were a lot of Christians who humbled themselves unto death rather than kneel before the statue of Caesar and burn incense to Caesar. We will obey God rather than men, and yet they knelt down. The Apostle Paul could very well, as a Roman citizen, use that Roman sword, the gladia, that the gladiators had to fight with. Peter had one. What did Jesus tell Peter about that sword? Put it away. Now here's where it gets tough if I want to talk about the American Revolution. I don't think I would have run out there in Boston and thrown all that tea in the harbor. But I would have been standing there and saying they have no right over there to take all of our money. As a Christian citizen, I can speak out and I better. Peter says, we cannot but speak the things we've seen and heard. And that's why I suspect you have a lot of people running for president and governor and attorney general and everything now that in their conscience says, I don't like them killing all those babies. And I think, now you don't, I'm going out on a limb because they're only a month away. I think the baby killers are going to win. I appreciated the Supreme Court. They didn't stop abortion. You know what they said? Abortion belongs to the states. See, I disagree with the Supreme Court too, but I'm not going to I'm not going to go charge into Washington with my guns and my swords and my my Confederate flag. Oops, I'm I didn't mean to go there. <laughs> But Pastor, your own religion, Lutheranism, is based upon protest. If Luther had been Martin Luther had been humbling himself, you wouldn't have a religion. Luther There's a what was being taught about God and what was the truth about God. And ultimately, when the peasants rose up against the government, he was horrified. 
I think Luther recognized the difference between the power of the state and the power of the church. But to, to go up against the Pope and to uh, criticize and try to correct the mistakes that were being perpetuated in the church, that's not going against God, and that's not necessarily going against any power of the civil government that requires, uh, that does not require adherence to it as opposed to God. Let, let's, uh, let's simply look at how Jesus is in control. For us in the church, he's given us all the answers. For us in the government, in civil government, he says, take civics in high school. He said, read history. Use your common sense. Look at the wickedness that's out there and see what you can do about it. But he has not told me on my own to pick up a gun and, and, and shoot all those people in the, in the uh, Planned Parenthood house. He might have the government draft me and tell me to go fight in a war. These get to be difficult decisions. Lots of Christians says, oh, oh I'll go to war, but I'm not going to carry a gun. Yeah. Okay, you take this medical bag. And so I think each Christian has to deal with how am I going to vote at this time? And I sure hope every Christian in America votes. That's where we get to put our two cents worth in. And maybe it doesn't sound like two cents worth in, but God is using our two cents worth too. We are not like the Swifts in Switzerland. When Swingley gathered an army to go against the Romans. Luther said, we're not going to gather an army and invade France. He said, maybe if we need an army, we need to go to the, to the infidels coming in from Austria. But he said, that's the government's job. And he told Emperor Charles, you better stop that Islam horde. But Luther didn't get a gun and, and, and go to Vienna. You see what our tool is? Let's see how Jesus handles it before the Sanhedrin. He's, he's still bound, remember? When finally did he even speak? He stood in silence before Sanhedrin, before Caiaphas. Until I adjure thee by the living God. That's King James. <laughs> I bind you under oath to the Lord that you tell us if you're the Christ. And he answered, sure I'm the Christ. <laughs> you people in the civil government have every right to crucify me, even though you know better. Human reason told Pilate, I shouldn't be doing this. But then Jesus said, the time is coming when you will see the Son of Man coming in power and great glory. And that kind of is a good answer for us too. The day will come when Christ is going to come with power and glory and do just what we've been praying for. If you want a handy study, study Psalms 30 to 70 and see how often David prays that the Lord would strike down the enemy. I am praying that abortion does not become something whenever you want to do it. That's a prayer. But I'm not going down to the clinic. But it already is. Abortion already is. You, you can, it, yeah. before, before the Supreme Court decision, you can get an abortion in almost any place. Yep. And I will continue to pray that God stops it. And I know 
I know the punishment coming from those who have violated the word of the Lord. And that's where the psalmist comes along. The psalmist says, Lord, you will destroy those. I probably will not go down to the local radio station and teach this class. <laughs> no, I would suggest not. <laughs> <laughs> but there were times in Huntsville, Alabama, when I was first invited to defend the Lutheran position. Uh, I go into that Protestant church and explain the original sin and baptism. I went into a couple of radio stations to answer the questions of the moderator and say, this is what I believe. I, I'm willing when the Lord puts an opening in front of me to tell them what thus saith the Lord. Okay, on Calvary. What did Jesus do on Calvary? Shows us his great power and might. The earthquake, the darkness. But what happened to him? He allowed the Roman soldiers to carry out the Roman government's command, crucify him. That's what Pilate said. Take him away. Crucify him. Those soldiers had a civil government command. Now, the only disciple that was even there was John. And John didn't try to stop anybody. I think Mary pleaded, don't do this, don't do this. I really think Mary and, and, uh, and her sister Salome were right there saying, how can you do this? And Jesus shows his control. John, take care of Mary, the woman. He's releasing Mary from the thought of, this is my baby, you need to shelter me. I'm doing what God told me to do. I lay down my life of my own free will. Number 10, we can see the hand of God in history, how he controlled Greece to spread the Greek language, how he, how he, he let Leif Erikson find that there was another big continent over here that all these Native Americans, no, they weren't, it wasn't even called America. All these natives on this Western continent were already there. And he allowed Christopher Columbus to get in those three tiny boats and, and discover Puerto Rico. And he let them make this big mistake of thinking those were Indians. This is a long ways from India. This is half a world away from India. So give me some examples. How did God control Stalin when he took over Russia? Ooh. It's a little harder. Come up with some examples of God in control. One of the, go John, go ahead. I would offer that Stalin and Mao Zedong and Hitler are terrible historical events that, as you said earlier, we do not have the time between us and the events to judge. A lot of history has not unfolded yet. <clears throat> perhaps in another hundred years, perhaps in a couple thousand years or whenever, we will look back and we will say, well, that's obvious. But we're too close now. How could God elect a Christian Anglican and an American Christian say to Hitler, that's okay, you can have Austria, but that's all. Boy, I think there must have been a lot of Christians back saying, Chamberlain, what are you doing? 
Or FDR, how can you sign away a third of Europe? God was in control. Maybe, I'll give you the one that's just come up recently. We fought the longest war ever before Afghanistan in Vietnam. And how many of our people died in Vietnam? They died only because we didn't want dominoes to fall. But what did God work out of it? We are building a seminary in Hanoi. We have only have over 200 pastoral students in Hanoi preaching the gospel in North Vietnam. That's my God in control. Boy, I don't see it very often. Uh, let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, 12, page 1203. You'll recognize 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Love. Love is going to rule, but it rules in the church. Love doesn't get very far out there in the government. <laughs> Civil government did not in any way say to those Apaches, you know, we are a merciful people. No, we're a powerful people. You stay on the reservation. They didn't understand love. Today's government doesn't understand love. You know, there's a little bit there, human reason. You see this horrible storm go across Florida, and people all over America are saying, our hearts are with you. I've heard people like the president say, our thoughts and prayers are with you. Now, I don't want him to start praying for me. <laughs> I don't know what prayer he's going to come up with. Yeah. Civil government isn't there to pray. Uh -huh. They can send out rescue workers. They can send out boats and helicopters. Great, I want the civil government to do that. And in the end, even our five churches around Fort Myers will probably be rebuilt better than they were before they were destroyed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That happened in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. The rebuilding of our churches in New Orleans and Metairie were fantastic opportunities for Christian service. I heard that Arizona sending a whole bunch of people from the Red Cross. And you know the Red Cross, got the cross? The Red Cross kind of has both, a, a, a foot in both kingdoms, kind of. We can support the Red Cross as they're going out there to help people. But we're not with the Red Cross to huddle with everybody in prayer and now bow down to Jesus. And there's maybe an opportunity that we can walk the streets and say, you know, the Lord is calling all of us to repent. Maybe that's what he was leading, leading those German. This, I just thought of an answer. You don't have to wait for Pastor Henning. <laughs> Maybe the Lord was saying to those materialistic Lutherans, those earthly minded Lutherans, there's something more important than being locked in jail. There's something more important than taking Austria and France into our, your, our, your control. Get down on your knees. Bow to the Lord Jesus. Repent of your sins. Confess, I believe Christ is Lord. Jesus is Lord. And I think that is a safe biblical answer. We must obey God rather than men. What? And then everything will be hunky dory? You do that and Hitler is, disappears? And all the problems in Germany evaporate? Is that what you're saying? No, my problem here is not, oh, that's okay that Hitler does it. My, my response is, that's horrible. How could he do that? How could he wipe out cities? How could he destroy so many Russians when they went to take Leningrad? How can he destroy so much?
terrible. But you know, there's a little bit of good coming out of it. And so, I don't have the answer. The only good I see coming out of it is that you know who to hate. That's the only good I, I see coming out of that. You know who to direct, you know who to direct your hate. To submit, yeah, I agree. To submit that hate and that anger and that frustration to say, look, God, I'm gonna put it in your hands. I do that when I go to the hospital. I go to the, you mean it's an hour already, right? That's what you're saying. Get in there. I got it. Well, you see where we are. No, no, no. I, I had a comment to what we're talking about. Uh, we can go as long as you want. Uh, but, you know, I don't think anybody, especially today, can look back historically and say anything good about Hitler or any Well, I just tried a little bit there, Bill. I tried a little bit. But, okay. but at the same time, uh, was he put to an end? Yeah. <laughs> and, and who allowed that to happen? Who directed that? Who controlled that? God. So, yeah, he sure killed a lot of people in the meantime, but, but it wasn't an indefinite thing. Walter A. Meyer in his Lutheran Hour during the war said, don't you see this is a call even to us to stand with our government against that evil? So how many millions of soldiers went over to stop Hitler? They realized the evil Hitler was doing. But God did not intervene with a Hurricane Eon hitting Berlin. Now, did God want Eon to destroy what it destroyed? God's will is sometimes allowing. God's will is not always promoting. And we'll get to some of that later. We didn't really come up with the answer to when you're going to know the answer. <laughs> Somebody look ahead to the Corinthians. When are we going to know the answer? Wait a minute. I think it's open. Okay. Now, here at 1126, now we see but a poor reflection in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, just a really tiny part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. When is then? In love time. My wife probably knows the answers already. She's not been talking to me. <laughs> Rich man knew that Lazarus wasn't going to tell him anything. I think in studying here, if nothing else, it's going to lead us to stand firmly when we vote. Study, study, study. And I remember a couple years ago, before the turn of the millennium, somebody said, all I can do is hold my nose and vote, but I'm going to vote. Human reason, the lesser of two evils. The Christian, Lord, why do you make these decisions so hard? For all of you who heard at home, I hope I gave enough background here. Uh, bottom line to go home with, Christ is in control of all nations, through all history, even though we do not see it. Trusting that he is in full control, the Christian will submit to the governing authorities because all authority is from God. So when the government drafts me, I may say, I'll serve, but I won't carry a gun. I'll not say, it's against my conscience, I'm going to Canada. <laughs> may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and our fellowship in the Holy Spirit continue forever. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Bobby. If your Bibles don't have covers.